Okay, well, I was given the cue that basically I decide when I want to start. <laughs> so, let's start. Thank you all of you for being here. Um, most of the people I saw yesterday evening were as much shocked about what we do as intrigued as why we would want to do what we do. And I think that's the most important question. It's not what we do, it's why we do it. And um, any entrepreneur, anybody who has been a corporate person who's actually then gone into the entrepreneur life, you should ask them, what was the tipping point? What made you change? The whole of MBNF actually started this way. That you have to imagine is me. It wasn't because I had my ears like that. Um, I'm an only child. I was a very lonely child. My, my parents actually didn't pay much attention to me. My mum would hate me if she heard me. And um, my room was my prison and my kingdom. And for my whole childhood, I was all alone, imagining that I was a superhero, I was a fighter pilot, I was, uh, I was Han Solo, or Luke Skywalker, it depended on the days. And, um, and then I became a very reasonable man, because my father who was Swiss, was a very reasonable man, I wanted to be like him, and then I became an engineer, and then something happened. I got into the watchmaking world when I had absolutely no intention whatsoever. But before we get there, this is uh, actually what my childhood was all about. And when you see that, you understood a little bit better our flying saucers, our space, um, space how do you call them, um, ships, and etc., etc. What it was. Would you please make your way to Gallery 10 on the first floor where the session is about to commence? Thank you. There we go. Um, so, what, what we had also in Switzerland, which you probably didn't have in this part of the world, was um, Japanese mangas. Anybody who was brought up in France, Switzerland, or Italy knows Grandizer, which was called Goldorak. That was, he was basically saving the world every day, and I was saving the world every day. So, as I said, that that doesn't just that explains a part of it. The other part is I started in the world of watchmaking 20 years ago. Why? Because I stopped one day while I was skiing on a ski slope with some friends to have a coffee and there there was Henri John Belmont who was then the managing director of Jaeger with his family and I'd met a couple of times through a personal through a university project. And we talk, he says, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to work for Procter & Gamble or for Nestle and big corporation. I want to go and work in marketing. And um, um, basically, I want to leave Switzerland because I'm bored of this horrible country. He said, okay. And at the end of those 15 minutes where we had a coffee, I actually told him as a joke. And I said, well, and if Procter & Gamble doesn't give me a job, you can always give me a job at Jaeger. And he laughed and I laughed because it was a joke. That's it. A week later, he has his assistant call me up and say, um, maybe you could go up to the manufacturer and meet with Mr. Belmore. He would like to talk to you. Right. Okay, I'm a young schmuck. I'm still ready to open, look at a few opportunities. Go up there with my beaten up Opel Corsa, which would probably be a Vauxhall Nova here. And um, that's the most incredible interview of my life. It lasted three hours. And during three hours, Henri John Belmont did not ask me one question. For three hours, he took me through his company, which was his baby, the manufacturer Jaeger, which was in a derelict state. We're talking of 19, beginning of 91. And he said, oh, this is, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to change that, we're going to buy these new machines, we're going to hire new people, um, we're going to re remake the reversal because nobody wants it today, etc., etc." And after three hours, he looked at me and said, Okay, you got the job. I said, sorry? What, what job? He said, I need a young man like you, an engineer, passionate about watchmaking. You're going to be my product manager. We're going to create all the products together. I said, wow, okay. Um, but I have to think about it because I was interviewing with Nestle, I was interviewing with P&G, and um, my idea of going to live up in the Valley de Joux in a work for a half-bankrupt company was not exactly the, the 
perspective I had of future. And um, he told me one of the most important phrases in my life. He just looked at me and said, I give you three weeks. I said, no, no, I need more time. He said, no, no, no. You have to know one thing in your life. Do you want to be one amongst 200,000 people in a big corporation? Or do you want to be one amongst the four or five of us who are going to relaunch this incredible brand? Uh, thank you, Mr. Belmore. I drove back home, and the next morning I called him up, and I said, OK, that was 20 years and eight months ago. And since, it's been rock and roll. Seven years at Jaeger, you have to understand that 1991, I used to go and see the best retailers on the planet and say, show whatever we had, and they would tell me, young man, that thing which turns has no future. Why the hell would anybody buy it? Seven years later, when I left, Jaeger was doing 40,000 reversos. So I used to um, work from 8 in the morning to 8 in the evening. And at 8 in the evening, Belmore would come and collect me, Yannick, the designer who's here in the, in the fair, who's still there 20 years later. And Yasmina used to work in communication. We all used to live up in the Valley Jew during the week. And we'd go and have dinner together. So for most people, that's horrendous. Go and have dinner with your boss every evening is probably the least thing you want to do. But it was incredible. And because Belmont could only speak about one thing, his baby, Jaeger, how he was going to relaunch this company. And for a young guy out of university, it was absolutely incredible. So years like that where I learned, I actually learned how to work. I learned watchmaking. I learned everything I know today. And every headhunter would call me. I would go, not interested. No, they usually had, they wanted to give me the same job, but a little bit more money. I was like, no, 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 I'm not interested. And um, one day, 1998, seven years later, one headhunter, Egon Zender, who only does top executives, calls me up and says, well, we've heard about you. We want to interview you before, but maybe there's a job you could do. And their curiosity got the best of it. So drove down to Geneva. They interviewed me for an hour and a half. And they said, OK, you're 10 years too young. I was 31. But you could do this. It's like, what? Managing director of Harry Winston timepieces. You must be out of your mind. I was then a marketing and sales manager, I think. And I um, said, look, there are 40 candidates. Why don't you do it? Try. Do the interviews. So I went to all the interviews, completely calm, cool, and collected. And no, not a chance in hell of having the job. And um, after four months, they gave me the job. So suddenly, what I forgot to mention, I also come from a pretty simple family. Nobody in my family is even a director of anything. Um, suddenly, I'm a managing director of a watch brand. What I don't know is that Harry Winston timepieces is virtually bankrupt. What I don't know is that Harry Winston, for many different reasons, which is, of course, completely different Harry Winston to what it is 13 years later, was being sold, the head office in New York. And um, I start off in the worst year of my life ever, 1998-99. Um, we've got the wrong suppliers, the wrong retailers, the wrong product, no cash at all. We barely know how to pay the salaries at the end of the, uh, the month. New York tells me, you swim or you sink, but that's your problem. We're not going to help you. We were counting the watches. We're counting for 3 or 4% of the global revenue of Winston. And um, for that year, working 17 hours a day, going crazy, having a major ulcer after three months, with the little team, we were only eight of us, we actually managed to more or less save the company after a year. And then the next six years were incredible. From 2000 to 2005, we take that company from eight people to 80, from $8 million to $80 million. Uh, I think when we leave, we're like accounting for major part of the business of the, of the group. And we create the Opus line. We, um, we put Harry Winston on the map of watchmaking. And I learned two things then. The first is I, I'm actually capable of doing this, which you have no idea that you can do this sort of stuff before you're actually confronted to it. And the second, which is a little bit more weird, is that I actually don't like doing this. That the bigger Winston is growing, the more power, the more money, the more recognition I'm getting in the market, the less I'm enjoying myself. I don't really understand why. And then it hits me 
again, unfortunately, it's always some tough times which make you realize a lot of things. Um, it hits me when my father passes away, which was 10 years ago. Um, unfortunately, wasn't really much, very much on talking terms with him. And I realized that I have no idea who my father was. I start wondering, did he have any regrets? I start wondering, would I have any regrets if something happens to me tomorrow? I think, yes. Everybody's super proud of me, but I'm not proud of what I'm doing. I'm not proud of my, what I'm doing for one most important reason. All I've been doing for 14 years is create products to please more people, to sell more pieces, to make more money, which is what's called a business. But it's a total abnegation of yourself. What about me? What, what, what about the crazy things I want to do, but which the corporation cannot accept? So I started dreaming of... Um, my dream company, something which would make me proud if ever something happened to me. First of all, creating only what I believe in. That's incredible luxury. You don't have to wonder if the clients will like it. You don't have to wonder if it's going to sell a lot. You'd have no shareholder pressure telling you to do more every year. Just do what you want to do. And the second point would be um, working only with people you actually really like. Have you all noticed that we accept in our professional life 10 times more excuse my French, crap, than we do in my, our personal lives. If in your personal life somebody lies to you, somebody bullies you, somebody manipulates you, whatever, and I'll forget a lot of other terms I have in mind, you just walk away and never see that person again. But in work, in business, you actually have to put up with that because that's how it works, because there's money involved, there's power involved, there's all sorts of things which make that you have to put up with it. And in a very naive, candid way, I said, no, I'm not going to put up with that. Because there's no way I could be proud of myself if I do. If my personal values, I trample them just because I want to make more money or I, I need whatever. I'm not going to do this. Hence the name, MBNF, Maximilian Busa and Friends. Only people who share the same values. And um, the other thing I understood growing Harry Winston most managers, they love having hundreds and thousands of people working for them. It's a, it's a power thing. It's horrible. It's absolutely horrible to manage a lot of people because you end up managing their problems, administrative problems, communication, motivation, politics, incompetence, you name it. That's all you do. The bigger a company becomes and you do less of what you like doing. So my company, in my dream company, is going to be always very small. And it has to be very small because if I'm going to create only what I believe in, and that's pretty extreme as you've already seen what we've done, and it's just the beginning, you're going to see some really, really more extreme things coming out in the future. I can only do that if I've got very few people working for me. Because if I've got five, 50 or 500 salaries to pay, I'll never have the courage to create that. So that's the fundamentals of why I created MBNF. Um, very small company, we're 10 of us. We did last year 152 machines, I'll explain why we call them machines. And um, we've got 20 retail partners worldwide. And that's fine, we don't need to do any more than that. I need to generate enough finance to always finance the next projects. That's what's most important for me in my life. The friends. Why would you call up? I mean, when I came out with the company's name, everybody was like, you're creating, the first piece was 180,000 Swiss francs. Like, you're creating 180,000 franc watch and you're calling the brand and friends? So, yeah, because all I do is have ideas. Sure, I was an engineer in a previous life, but you don't want me to engineer your watch. I can assure you of that. Um, all these people are independents, most of them, some of them now in the team, independents who work for the best brands. All these people, they, they, they'll be doing bridges, wheels, hand finishing, dials, cases, um, enameling, you, you name it. But all these people are incredibly talented craftspeople. And you've never heard of them. 
because they work for great brands as independents and they have to sign NDAs to say that you're not allowed to say that you work for us. Well, I'll spill a pot of beans. Jacques Rochat, who does the hand finishing of our movements, he does the Patek Minute Repeaters. He does the Breguet Minute Repeaters, but he's not allowed to say it. Well, not only in this case is he allowed to say it, that he works for us, but I actively tell the world this guy's a genius. And he's on our press kits, he's on our catalogs, he's on our internet website, you can even have his telephone, his email. Anybody who buys one of our pieces can actually have the names, faces, emails, telephones of every person who's worked on their piece. Because this is all about human passion. I know the word passion in our industry has been used and misused. This is really about passion. And what's incredible is that Jacques Rochard, I just spoke of, came to see me January 2010. And he said, you know what, Max? Thanks to you, I didn't have to lay off anybody during the worst year of my existence. I was like, what? Why? He said, because thanks to you, five new brands came to see me in 2009 in the middle of the worst crisis ever and said, you're the guy who does that for Busa? Can you please work for us? You don't know how good that made me feel. That's fantastic. They make my dreams come true. And I actually, for the first time of their life, give them a communication platform for their talent. So that's the whole idea. And many people ask us, how have you managed in six years? I created the company on 25th of July 2005. So six years to come out with five new movements, watches, call them how you, how you want. They actually are delivered on time, they work. And they, um, and how have you managed that with no money? I started the company with my little savings, 700,000 francs. We never put one cent more in the company from the beginning. You want to launch a watch brand, you put 10 million and then we start talking. Well, because I work with incredible people, but also because they're proud. And whoever you are, pride takes you much further than money. And that's one of the reasons we can do what we do. Now, we call them horological machines. Now, these are legacy machines, but why do we call them machines? I often say, and most people don't get what I mean, we create machines that give time, not machines to give time. So people are like, what the hell are you talking about? A machine to give time, what's important is time. It's a watch, you want to have time. A machine that gives time, what's important for us is the machine. We create kinetic sculptures. I wanted to call them kinetic sculptures. But there's a small Japanese brand called Seiko, who actually registered kinetic everywhere in the world, so I couldn't do that. Um, so we call them horological machines. The whole point of this, and if you're all watch lovers, you'll, you'll, you'll understand what I'm saying. Since 1970, we don't need a mechanical movement, do we? I mean, face it, for having time, we've all got our phones, our quartz movements, and everywhere. Why do we buy a mechanical movement? Because it's a work of art. Because it's an incredible piece of craftsmanship. Not because it's precise, accurate, and reliable. Come on. So, if it is a work of art, why are we mimicking the same object of the pre-70s, which had to be round with a dial and hands, because that was the only most practical and reliable way of giving time. So, of course, Tradition is a great thing, and I'm the first one to collect vintage pieces. I think tradition has to be respected, and no, uh, how do you say, no tree can grow if it doesn't have strong roots. But there is no reason why a whole industry keeps on copying what used to be done 50 or 100 years ago. So I decided, I often say I created MBNF by passion as by rage. Passion for 19th century watchmaking, rage that in the 20th century we didn't invent anything. So that's where we started creating these machines. I don't expect people to understand. That's what I wanted to do. So machine number one, I'll quickly go through it. You know, it's like writing your first novel. I can imagine I never actually did write a first novel, but that was my first novel. It was the first time I'm expressing myself and not trying to please a client. And it was horribly difficult because for 14 years I'd been geared up to please people. And so this, the whole message was two worlds coming together, Busa and friends, 
And where the friends come together, the heart is beating, where you've got the central tourbillon. It was the, um, also the first movement which was built like a human being. You've got four barrels, two barrels on each side, which bring the energy to the heart, which is at the center, so the lungs brings to the heart, the central tourbillon, from two sides. There were only two horological pieces ever which had that system. There was a pocket watch from Abraham Louis Breguet, and there was Peter Speak Marine's foundation pocket watch, which had two barrels, two gear trains coming to his central tourbillon. So we worked with Peter on this piece. And then from the heart, you send the indication, in English it works well, to the hands. In German and all the other countries that come to these doesn't work that well. So lungs, heart, hands. The whole point was stop telling us that we should buy watchmaking because a tennis player wears it or because a Formula One driver wears it. We're talking of watchmaking. We're talking of artisans. We're talking of people. So the first piece, that was my very strong message. We did 100 pieces. They're finished. We don't have them anymore. Uh, that was 2007. A uh, few details here. I'll go pretty quickly. Then machine number two. Now we come back to my first explanation of science fiction. Um, I don't know where I'm going to go with that. Yes, there we go. It's 1960s and 70s American comic books, science fiction. A moon base always resembled this. It was always a dome of glass. And under this dome, you had human beings living. And so for machine number two, which was a space station, we had this three-dimensional space station, and under each dome you had life. Jumping hour, retrograde minute, uh, retrograde date, north and south hemisphere, moon phase, and with an automatic winding system. Probably one of the most complicated cases in the history of watchmaking, the 102 components just in the case, and which allowed us to do very modular uh, interpretations. We, we're stopping HM2 now this year, and we will have done all in all about 225 pieces over a, f a little more than four years, so approximately 50 pieces a year. This is the, um, the movement, the engine, uh, Jean-Marc Viderecht on a Girard Perego base. So HM2 and HM3 have got GP bases. Then the whole complication is done by uh, Jean-Marc. Uh, again, we don't put round movements in funky looking cases. Whatever we do is completely holistic. The design of the movement and the design of the case is completely together. There are 349 parts in that piece. The battle axe rotor comes from my childhood hero, Grandizer, who had this amazing battle axe. So, yes, this double-axed um, 22 karat gold rotor. You can actually start seeing the three-dimensionality of what we start trying to do. Oh, that was an interesting feature. That's a, um, the crown, uh, how do you say, um, um, protection, which is actually also a system which allows you to click it out. First click, you change the date. Second click, you change the time. And then we just introduced this year the, what we call the final editions. It's interesting that also technologically, this transparent material there is not plastic, it's not glass, it's a block of sapphire. Now let's just think that 10 years ago, an Omega Speedmaster, probably even today, um, still has a plexiglass glass because we're being told that, oh, no, no, it's impossible to do a sapphire glass, which is domed. We actually made a block and went to see every single sapphire manufacturer in Switzerland and even outside Switzerland, and they all told us, no, no, it's impossible. And finally, one man accepted, Mr. Stettler, in Lise in Switzerland. He's got a very big company, but he thought, I don't know, he thought, these young guys are crazy, we're going to try and help them. I make enough money on the side, that's not the point. And he, he did do it. And it takes... 55 to 60 hours to machine a block like that and two out of three break because you see where the screws are? The holes are so close to the side that when they drill the 3.6 millimeters through with diamond lades, well, they break. So we're doing 18 pieces in black titanium and 18 pieces in um, red, gold, and sapphire, and that's the end of that. 
Then, after a space station, the logical step had to be that. And that's when we came out with machine number three. We're talking of 2009 here. This is a spaceship. You've got, on the, on the back, you've got the battle axe rotor, which is the engine powering it up. The two cockpits, cockpit of the hours, cockpit of the minutes. And you've got a floating date on ruby pallets, which goes all around. It's a little bit difficult to understand when you don't have the piece in your hand. You can see at the back, two very big ceramic ball bearing systems, because we, as we've got on the top this time, the regulating system and the, uh, and the winding system, well, of course, the whole gearing of the hours and minutes is underneath, so therefore, we have to bring it to the side and up. If you start using a good traditional method of having five wheels, well, guess what? You've got no more energy left anywhere. And we all know that in our world, um, energy is like water in the desert. You have to keep it as, uh, as protectively as you can. So that's why we, we use these um, ball bearing systems. Different variations of that. And then, it may seem a little bit weird, but when I created machine number three, I thought it was a very elegant watch. So I thought we can do much better than that. Well, better, much crazier. Let's do something really nuts. And that's when we created the frog. So the frog is the same system. Unfortunately, 30% of the movement is different. But instead of having hands going around, you have aluminum domes which turn under sapphire domes. Now, the aluminum domes need to have the weight of a hand because that's the weight which usually a movement turns. To manage to do that, we go from a block of aluminum, you machine the outside, you machine the inside, you leave a skin of 0.2 millimeters, and the whole dome weighs 0.56 grams. And then you do these incredible sapphire domes, and if you do the curve inside and outside just a little bit different, you suddenly have a magnifying glass and you feel like you're drunk when you look at your watch. That's not good. So, the, the, again, Stettler had to work for over a year to try and manage to do these very small domes with exactly the same curvature inside and outside. So those are the frogs. Then, number four, thunderbolt. So what's a thunderbolt? That's a thunderbolt. That's what happens when you're a kid who's been making model airplanes his whole youth. When I was not saving the world, I was making model airplanes. And, um, and so it was a fitting tribute to um, aviation. From there, we created this. Now, very honestly, I had the prototype of our Thunderbolt in my hand a good six months before we presented it to anybody. And I thought, who the hell is ever going to buy this? Leave alone, wear it. But we still did it. And just for that, it's probably the piece I'm the most proud of. And what is absolutely incredible is that we said we would do only 100 pieces over four years. There are many reasons for that. We've delivered to date 47 of them. And there are three left at retail level, meaning there are 44 on the wrist of somebody. That is incredible. And that's giving me much more strength and courage and force to go much further because I thought I've gone much too far already now. So now you're going to see what's going to happen afterwards. And so what is it? It's this incredible titanium casing and sapphire. In fact, in fact, the center part which you see in sapphire, which is sapphire, even Stettler told us, you out of your mind. There is no way we can do that. And they finally did. You take an ingot of sapphire, and you machine it for 185 hours. That's a month. One month to get to the exact cutting out curve, polishing inside and outside. They have given us two machines for four years, where every month, each machine comes out with one piece. That means two pieces a month. That's when everything is OK. And um, the more difficult piece is, 
come on, is the engine inside. That took us th three years to develop, fully new movements from scratch, 311 components. It's, um, oops, sorry. I don't see an image of before, shoot. It's a central balance wheel, two barrels, and the first ever vertical indications, meaning we have to have the central part, which looks like a pretty much normal watch. And then you have to demultiply it and have in every pod, if you want, on one side you've got all the gearings of the power reserve, on the other side you've got all the gearings of the hours and minutes. The crowns are actually in the reactors, so that crown winds up the engine, the other crown changes the time. Kinetic sculpture. We, of course, don't need that to have time. Now, clearly, after HM1, 2, 3, and 4, everybody was wondering, what is the crazy number 5 going to be? And, um, and so, what people forgot, because too many people look at our designs and say, oh yeah, those are those crazy looking things. Whatever we do has got incredible watchmaking behind it. And we wanted to make a statement. You don't understand the watchmaking we're doing because you're only looking at the design. Let us explain to you what sort of watchmaking we're doing. So what people do actually don't know is that my passion is 19th century watchmaking. Because from 1780 to 1870, everything we know today, virtually everything you're going to see out there, was created. Chronographs, perpetual calendars, tourbillons, minute repeaters, grand sonnery, virtually every single escapement was created those golden 90 years. What have we been doing since? What have we been doing since? So, from there onwards, I started thinking, what would have happened if I'd lived a hundred years before? What would have happened if instead of being born in 1967, I'd been born in 1867 at the heydays? I don't know for you, but there was this amazing American uh, show called The Time Tunnel when I was a kid. These two American scientists who'd created a time-traveling machine, which of course went haywire and started sending them back and forward in, in time. So I was thinking, what would happen if I was born then? I would have wanted to create three-dimensional machines giving time, but I don't have Star Wars, I don't have my Japanese manga, I don't have my Thunderbolts. What would I have? Well, you realize one thing which is amazing. There was a lot of science fiction in the 19th century. Jules Verne. Jules Verne, the French author, talked about submarines, talked about flying to the moon, talked about flying around the world. But it was also an era where man wanted to defy gravity. And it was the era, somebody in fact told me yesterday, I hadn't even thought of it, it was saying the era of course of skyscrapers, the Eiffel Tower, the, 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 the bridges and so on. It was also the era where we invented the lift. Um, it was the era where the first men tried, started flying. So first, naturally, at some point, we were going to create the flying balance wheel. But this is the world I would have lived in if I'd lived in the 19th century. This is the science fiction people imagined. This is how people thought the future would look like. 1889, the whole of the French nation was against this monstrosity. You probably say the French are usually against a lot of things, but what would Paris be without that? This image I love. It's 1909, it's not 18th, 19th century. It's one of the first air shows. Look at the structure of the building behind. It's not the planes you have to look, it's the structure of the building. Absolutely incredible. So using all that and this, I started imagining what I would do. I sketched what would then become the legacy machine, showed it to my designer, Eric Giroud, very talented, incredibly talented designer, who's also created Opus 9 and Opus 11, etc. And he sort of looked at it and went, what the hell are you doing? I don't see any interest in this, and walks up and, and leaves. And then I show it to my partner in the company, Serge, who's the technical genius who makes this all happen. I say, look, look, I've had this idea of this flying balance wheel and a round watch of 19th century. And he looks at me and says, 
I didn't sign up for MBNF to do round watches. No, 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 we don't want to do this. So I had to battle with my whole team. And finally, after battling with everybody, uh, sorry, it's also, of course, the year of the pocket watches. We launched the project called Legacy Machine One. And so I went to see Jean-Francois Mojon. That was beginning of 2008. Two years later, he comes out with Opus 10. He's just unveiled a project. Well, IWC just unveiled a project he worked on, which is a Scafusia Sidereal. He's an incredibly talented engineer. And, but we needed somebody who was going to be the guardian of the 19th century values. And I dreamt of one person. It had to be Kari Vutilainen. It had to be Kari. So we all troop up to Motier to go and see Kari, explain the project. Don't show him the, the designs, just say what we want to do. And Kari, would you, would you do this with us? And Kari um, very politely said, no. I said, what? I said, no, I've got, I've got too much work. I can't. I'd love to, guys, but I can't. Oh, shit. So my trump card was the design. I took out the design and said, look, could you at least have a look at this and tell me what you think of it? Maybe give us a few cues. And he looked at that. And he's like, oh, oh you, we could do that and that and that. Oh, yes, and of course, and the, oh, I would put the bridge like that. And oh, the screws, I, I would design them like this. And he's mumbling all alone for two minutes. And suddenly he looks up from the, the design. And I look at him and I say, Curry, does that mean you're actually going to do it? And he smiled and he said, yes. That was one of the most amazing moments of that, that project. So I had my dream team, beginning of 2008, and we set upon creating this. From the back, it's an 1870-1880s pocket watch movement. It's been created from scratch. Kari designed everything. Jean-Francois engineered everything. And we, of course, didn't create a round watch, traditional watch because I believe I would not have created that in the 19th century. I believe I would create a three-dimensional machine. And hence, that's what it became. The first ever flying balance wheel. The, um, I believe, but I'm not absolutely sure of that, the first ever totally independent two-time zone watch, meaning the two dials, which are two like pocket watch dials, had, with one balance wheel, give two totally independent times, but to the minute, not to the half hour, not to the hour. They're completely independent. You can actually use, I didn't realize up until about four weeks ago when I was presenting it to people, that you can use one of the counters as a stopwatch. You just put it at 12, it actually becomes a counter. And what you see at south is the first ever vertical power reserve indicator. So defying gravity flying balance wheel. 19th century is also the era of all the great explorers, two time zones. And the, the era of the machine, because 19th century is all about the universal exhibitions, where all the, the countries come and show their machines, the lever of the power reserve. So that's legacy machine number one, which you see here. The balance wheel is 14 millimeters diameter. It's probably the largest you'll ever see in a wristwatch. It's an 18,000 oscillation movement, like a 19th century movement, and it regulates incredibly well. White gold, red gold, and that's legacy. So from now on, no, we haven't gone classic. We've done HM1, 2, 3, and 4. This year, doing LM1, next year, I come back to my childhood and create HM5. And then the year after is LM2, and then so on, HM6, and H, uh, LM3, and HM7. They're all in the pipeline at different stages. It all depends on how much cash comes back into the company, where we can actually further all the different projects. So actually, I am th traveling through time. Every year, I go back and forth 100 years. So there you go. It's been a long way up from here to there and there. But it's just the beginning because it gives me enormous courage to see that actually what we've done, 
people actually like it, which is very weird for me. And, um, and that we're lucky that virtually at the beginning of each year we sell a minimum of, of the next 12 months of production. So get ready for what's going to come closer. But what I will invite you to, for those who haven't seen it, is go and see the pieces in real. Because as everybody told me yesterday, and for many days, ah, it doesn't look, but the photos really don't give it justice. You have to see the pieces in 3D, because I think they're really worth it. So there you go. Thank you very much for your attention. Nice talking to you. Thank you. Questions by any chance? I know it's always a difficult moment. Please. If you'd been born in 2067, what would you have made? I don't want to think about it. Because I wouldn't know what the references are. Because I could do the whole idea of 1867 because you can just go into Wikipedia and start reading and start understanding what it's all about. But especially because it's the time of the great masters. I don't know if, I just saw three weeks ago the latest Woody Allen film, Midnight in Paris. For those of you who've seen it, it's this American writer of today who ends up going back into the 20s and meeting Hemingway and Scott Fitzgerald and Pablo Picasso. And for him, it's like, wow, this is amazing. Imagine that. That's what I was imagining. I have no idea what's going to happen in 2067. And that's a good question, you know, because I often wonder, doing my selfish little creative process with all my friends who believe in what we do, is what's going to happen in a Christie's or Sotheby's catalog in 50 or 100 years when a thunderbolt arrives in the market? What will people say? The work of some crazy guy whose work died with him? Um, the beginning of a trend which sparked a certain amount of creators to do three-dimensional watches but died out very quickly? Or the missing link between what horology used to be and what could be. And I have no idea, and honestly, I don't care. Because I'm not here like Steve Jobs to save the world or change the world. I'm here to create what I really want to create. And whatever history wants to make out of it, it will. Other questions? I'll be out there anyway till 9 o'clock this evening, so if anybody's got questions, no problem. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.